welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, afternoon. Um, thank you for sharing the link and inviting your friends if you did. Um, so if you are in a co cohort, thank you for coming. If you're new to WEMLA, new to the Leadership Academy, uh, welcome. Um, this is our very first Courageous Leadership Learning Series webinar, um, facilitating unpracticed conversations about race. And you are in for a treat, a wealth of information on how to um, prepare for facilitating conversations about race as you prepare for PD, or even just engaging, um, engaging your staff or just um, preparing yourself to engage in some of those conversations. My name is Lauren, I am the program manager. Um, for the West Michigan Leadership Academy. And before we get started, I just want to direct your attention to some key features um, that will just make your um, time spent a little bit more engaging. There are three features at the bottom. There's a chat feature, raise your hand in a Q&A. So as you hear some information, if you have questions, you wanna engage with some content, if, so, if there's something that resonates with you, go ahead and type in the chat box. If you have a question that you wanna to pose to us, you can um, drop it in the Q&A box. Myself and Annalise will be monitoring that. Um, but there will be time at the end for you to um, ask questions. Um, Abby will be um, answering some, myself and Annalise will be answering some, but I think that the content that you will hear today will be beneficial to you. Um, this session is um, being recorded. Um, so uh, you will hear this information again, we'll be sure to share it out to those of you who registered um, and share it with, you know, whomever uh, will find this information beneficial. Um, but once again, thank you. And at this time, I will pass it off to Abby to just share a little bit of information about the Leadership Academy and the West Michigan Leadership Academy and dive right into the content. So Abby, off to you. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so glad to have you join us on this Thursday afternoon in October. Uh, and just a few words of introduction for those of you who may not be as familiar with us and our organization. So we are the Leadership Academy, a nonprofit focused on developing school leaders at all levels of educational systems to be culturally responsive anti-racist leaders. So this means that we deliberately focus on developing leaders' ability to identify and disrupt systemic inequities and intentionally change and build systems that value and leverage students' identities in order to support them in achieving academic, social, and emotional success. We work in school systems uh, across the country, but with you today is the West Michigan-based team of the Leadership Academy. Uh, you met Lauren McElrath, who introduced and kicked us off today. We also have Annalise Contras uh, and myself. Uh, I'm Abby groff uh, and I will be kind of kicking us off here and, and digging into the content. Um, our primary roles here in Grand Rapids uh, involve supporting our local programming, the West Michigan Leadership Academy School Leader Fellowship. But we also, uh, as a team and individually, collaborate with our national colleagues in designing and facilitating professional learning for school leaders across the country. And in all of those endeavors, of course, we focus on culturally responsive anti-racist leadership. And we are excited to share our practice with you today. Uh, what we've found to be particularly powerful and effective in facilitating cross-racial conversations about race and racism. And I want to preface our time today by saying that we consider ourselves experienced practitioners uh, rather than experts uh, as we approach each facilitation opportunity as an opportunity to practice and learn. Now in our time together today, we are first going to highlight the need and the unavoidability of engaging in conversations about race and racism and talk about why despite this overwhelming need, people may often be reticent to engage or try to avoid it altogether. Then we're going to discuss how grounding ourselves in our own personal racial identities helps us as a facilitator of cross-racial conversations about race and racism. And finally, we'll talk about some helpful approaches for facilitation, some tangible actions that you can learn, practice, and put to use. So why do we need to talk about race and racism? Uh, the simple answer is that we are surrounded and impacted by issues of race and racism every day. 
And though we acknowledge that race is a social construct without biological basis, it is nevertheless very real. Racism and its effects are evident in nearly every aspect of our daily lives. As Dr. Ibram X. Kendi says in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, we are surrounded by racial inequity, as visible as the law, as hidden as our private thoughts. Certainly racism lives within hearts and minds, but perhaps even more perniciously, it is baked into the laws, policies, and practices of our society. Consider that the median wealth, meaning the total value of all assets, less the total value of all debts, of white families is over 41 times that of black families and over 22 times that of Latinx families. The most important asset in calculating total wealth is homeownership, an asset from which black and brown families have been systematically denied from, benefiting through such policies as redlining and discriminatory lending. In a related economic statistic, one in three black and indigenous children live in poverty versus one in four Hispanic and one in 11 white children. A long history of racial discrimination in access to high quality K-12 education, access to post-secondary education and employment opportunities underlie the earnings power of black and brown parents and families. Indeed, current studies show that on average, white individuals with lower levels of formal education out earn black and brown individuals with more formal education and college degrees. Racially disproportionate representation in low wage essential employment and inequitable access to high quality health care has been highlighted this year by the racially disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black and brown families. If the mortality rate across races were equal in this pandemic, more than 21,000 Black people, 11,000 Latinx people, and 750 Indigenous people would still be alive today. In another timely topic, one in 13 Black Americans of voting age is currently disenfranchised, meaning that they have been denied the ability to vote by legal or structural impediment, including voter suppression laws like ID requirements. A significant proportion of those who are disenfranchised are related to the last bullet point, which I'll pull up here in just a second, in that most states deny persons serving current sentences for felony convictions the right to vote. And 12 states deny the right to vote even after the time has been served, meaning that they are uh, disenfranchised for their entire life. And of course, it is well established that the incarceration of Black Americans has long been unequal, inequitable, unjust, and deliberate. From the prison farms of the post-Civil War South to the law and order and war on drugs policies of the Nixon and Reagan eras, to the three strikes law of the Clinton administration and their ongoing legacies, Black Americans have been targeted and imprisoned at rates exponentially higher than other citizens. If incarceration rates remain unchanged, one in three black men born in 2001, those are the young men whom you graduated from your schools a year ago, will spend time in prison at some point in their lives. So racism is baked into our systems and policies and it's not invisible by any means. And it's also reflected in our hearts and minds, which for some people can often be easier to see than these legal matrices upholding racially inequitable outcomes. The most recent Race in America survey from the Pew Research Center shows that 65% of Americans believe it has become more common in the last four years for people to express racist or racially insensitive views, and 45% perceive that these views seem to have become more acceptable over the same time period. It's everywhere and we notice it. Interestingly, a recently released report from Citigroup sought to quantify the economic impact of racism in the last 20 years, seemingly making an effort to connect hearts and minds to the policies of racial discrimination, appealing maybe to the economic values of citizens and policymakers who may still be on the fence about the moral imperative of individuals to dismantle racism. This study found that the US economy as a whole could be $13 trillion richer had black entrepreneurs had equitable access to small business loans. Another $2.7 trillion richer had wages been equitable for black workers. Another $218 billion richer had mortgage lending been racially equitable and up to $113 billion richer on top of that had access to higher education been equitable. 
Race and racism permeate every aspect of our everyday lives, and yet we don't talk about it like it does. Overall, only 13% of American adults say that race often comes up in conversations with friends and family. The frequency of discussing race varies by race, with Black and Asian adults the most likely to talk about it, while 50% of whites rarely or never talk about it. And while Black parents talk to their children about race at about the same rate as they talk to other adults about it, 74% of white parents rarely or never talk to their children about race. Of course, children have other caring adults in their lives, namely teachers and other educators who have the opportunity to cultivate their racial consciousness. And overall, teachers seemingly engage children in conversations about race more often than their own parents do. Yet even 40% of teachers report that they rarely or never have conversations about race with their students. Some will argue that children, especially younger children, our elementary kids, are not developmentally ready or capable of engaging in these conversations about race. But research shows that they are. At three months old, babies exhibit preferences for faces that match the complexion of their primary caregivers. By three years old, children have internalized the association of minoritized racial groups with negative traits and a year later associate white people with high status markers. By seven years old, our first graders, these children perceive discrimination based on race. Children are ready to talk about race and racism and they are ready young. So not only are children development, developmentally ready to engage in conversations about race and racism, but research demonstrates that there are many, many benefits to doing so for children and adults alike. It expands critical consciousness or the ability to analyze and push back on racially discriminatory forces in society. It increases racial literacy or the ability to recognize, respond to, and resist forms of everyday racism. It dispels stereotypes and misinformation that we that we take in about racial groups, both consciously and unconsciously. It cultivates compassion within and across racial difference. And it creates a greater sense of belonging and connectedness among all racial groups. So if we're primed to talk about race and racism from a young age, and there are so many documented advantages to doing so, even the possibility of working towards solutions to racial inequity, as Gloria Ladson Billings suggests, why do we avoid talking about race and racism? Let's hear first uh, from author and activist, Rennie Edo Lodge. I'm told I was four years old when I turned to my mom and I said, well, you know, when am I going to turn white? I was consuming and engaging with media and culture around me, a lot of cartoons, a lot of kids' TV, comics, et cetera, et cetera. And, while well, all the good people were white and I considered myself to be a good person. I realised at that early age that to be white was to be human. I was attempting to discuss race in white dominated circles and really getting nowhere. I wrote a blog post, um, I titled it Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Let's say we were having a broad conversation about inequality. As soon as I um, tried to raise the topic of race, there was an almost immediate clamp down, shut down denial from my conversation partner. They tried to find ways to convince me that absolutely no race had nothing to do with it, that actually I had a chip on my shoulder, um, and that, you know, why was I trying to make everything about race? I'd actually decided to have a conversation with a person who I would can now confidently say is probably is a white anti-racist, a white critical anti-racist. And I spoke to her about her journey and I said, well, what's led to you being somebody who is so aware of how race shapes inequality? She said that a lot of her defensiveness initially when it came to these conversations about race was a fear of being wrong. You know, a fear of, uh, she said it, a lot of it was to do with her ego, uh, a fear of being implicated in, in existing inequalities a fear that she actually wasn't doing enough. I know that I have not spoken out in the past for fear of losing a job or losing a friend or losing a space in a house share. Um, because when you discuss race in the conversation, you become the troublemaker, you become the problem.
So as you heard reflected uh, by Ms. Edo Lodge, the reluctance to engage in conversations about race, especially in cross-racial settings, is usually grounded in different reasons for white people and Black, Indigenous, and people of color. But talking about race and racism for Black and brown people uh, it can be difficult because first it elicits strong emotions, which I feel like I should point out is not a bad thing. Emotions are wise, they're inherent, uh, and they're part of these discussions. However, the emotions attached to unpacking and reliving experiences of discrimination and oppression can inhibit a person's ability and desire to engage. Black, Indigenous, and people of color may be uncertain that the space is safe for them to engage in cross-racial conversations. They carry an uncertainty about whether or not they will receive support in speaking their truths and whether or what consequences may be tied to doing so. White supremacy culture and the centering of whiteness as a cultural norm create an environment in which Black, Indigenous, and people of color worry about whether what they say and how they say it will be done in the quote unquote right way or in line with these norms, often having experience that if they don't, their voices may be disregarded or silenced. And finally, they are too often positioned by white people as their own personal teachers about issues of race and racism, which is exhausting. And white people are capable of and need to do their own self-education, but they are often reluctant to step into that learning space and engage in conversations about race and racism because they carry a lot of fear. White people often are afraid of appearing racist. They're afraid of realizing their own racism. They're afraid of confronting their own white privilege because that then requires that they take personal responsibility and action to disrupt racism. So managing these fears requires that white people work through their discomfort and their reluctance to engage. Now, understanding the reasons that all people may be hesitant, reluctant, and are uncomfortable in engaging in conversations about race is important to you as a facilitator of cross-racial conversations, regardless of your racial identity, because it helps you plan your approach, encourage participation, and manage dialogue in the moment. Reluctance to engage for everyone is largely grounded in emotions, fear, uncertainty, exhaustion, frustration. Recognizing and naming when and with whom these emotions are coming up in the dialogue is helpful in digging into and moving through those tough spots, which we'll talk about a bit more later. But first, we're gonna talk about another important foundation to facilitating conversations about race, and that's getting comfortable in our own skin. So it's important for you as a facilitator of cross-racial conversations to be grounded in your own racial identity and the dynamics of racial identity in general. While everyone enters conversations about race having been impacted by racism, each individual's level of consciousness about that impact is different. And in getting very clear about your own level of consciousness and racial identity, you can build connections and scaffolds with and for participants as conversations unfold. Now one tool, uh, racial identity development theory, uh, is useful for self-reflection and building empathy and understanding of people who identify differently than ourselves. And there are different versions of racial identity development theory that align with different racial identities. Uh, this is a tool that can help us understand that we aren't born to a certain level of racial consciousness and understand and that understanding and de developing that consciousness and our own identity is a process that we go through. Now, I do want to emphasize that these frameworks are a useful tool, but they do come with some caveats. So first of all, this is theory that helps explain racial identity development. It's not a set of hard and fast rules. We acknowledge that not everyone will go through every stage of, of this framework. Uh, the stages also, as although they're often presented like this as linear, uh, they can in fact be nonlinear uh, and even cyclical that you move back and forth through the different stages. And they cannot and they do not describe all possibilities or experiences. Now that being said, connecting to and understanding our own personal experiences of racial identity development, help us understand and use our own stories to frame and support learning as facilitators. And storytelling is an especially important tool in culturally responsive anti-racist leadership and facilitation. So as Howard Stevenson has said, 
Racial storytelling allows us to identify what stresses us, how we cope with and react to racial stress and how we hide emotionally. It undermines the tendency to question one's own experience, to belittle the experience of someone else, to walk arrogantly in spite of another's pain, to deny the racial disparities of health, justice, and compassion all around us, and to pretend that all of our life experiences are universal. Without racial storytelling, educators, politicians, parents, law enforcement, and children are stuck tolerating differences, acquiescing to levels of racial avoidance rather than committing to the higher ground of racial literacy and competence of humanity. Racial storytelling then grounded in our own experiences of racial identity development helps us as facilitators by giving us a way to own and share our experiences, identify and manage our emotions, demonstrate care and compassion, and cultivate racial consciousness in ourselves and others. So to illustrate how getting comfortable in our own experience, to illustrate how getting comfortable in our own experiences is, is helpful as facilitators, uh, Lauren and Annalise are going to share some of their stories of their own racial identity development and talk a little bit about how uh, both storytelling uh, and understanding racial identity development has helped them as facilitators. So Lauren, I'm going to ask that that you share first. All right. Thanks, Abby. So imagine a room about this size. There are tables and chairs in a room full of colleagues, but only a handful that are Black, Indigenous, or person of color. And getting up to sneeze, getting water, or going to the bathroom would be noticeable. More noticeable than my neighbor next to me, but these are my colleagues and my friends. And I shouldn't think twice about going for out for a bio break, but I do. Once I have an in internal debate with myself, I find the most appropriate pause in the current dialogue and I decide that, okay, now is the time to go. I scoot my chair back and I rush away to the bathroom. Upon my return, I hadn't sat down in the chair all the way before I heard my name and I was asked, Lauren, what do you think? And immediately I froze. My body went hot and I was placed in the hot seat. I had some idea of what we were discussing before I left, but I had just gotten back from the restroom because I was one of the newer employees, I was black, and because it was a superior asking me the question, I felt like I had to answer. I was conflicted and I was visibly uncomfortable and only one of my colleagues noticed it. She knew the look on my face and she knew because she's experienced this before and she knew because she too was black. After I took my best stab at answering the question, she motioned for me to meet her in the hallway and we both got up. Trying to play it cool, she asked me if I was okay and I tried to play it cool and I said, yeah, 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 I'm good. And she said, um, no, you're not. I saw the look on your face and you know you didn't have to answer that, right? Um, she didn't call on nobody else before you and you could have chosen for her, you could have told her to go to somebody else. And she asked me why I didn't, you know, have the, the agency to tell her to move on to the next person. And I told her all the thoughts that went through my head that I was new, I was black, and you can't tell the, she's the boss technically. Um, so I told her all the things that went through my head. And it was in that moment that I realized the characteristics of white dominant culture was so deeply ingrained in me. And in that moment, it was very damaging. The idea of perfectionism, the sense of urgency, paternalism, the right to comfort. It was that situ situation that really made me dig deep into the, the depth of my like racial identity journey. And I had a lot of work to do. I had to continue to unpack the internalization um, that really had been impressed upon me for years. Throughout elementary, secondary, post-secondary, and even through my professional career, it's a journey that never ends and it's constantly evolving. So that's my story. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing your story. Um, I have a couple of questions in follow-up for you. Um, so where do you see, and this really interesting, 
in the story that you just shared, where do you see yourself uh, in relation to your own racial identity development? Yeah, in that moment, and um, definitely in the within the first stage, I was completely unaware um, of, of the implications of white culture that it had on me, the internal, internalization of white dominant culture. Um, I feel like I toggled between stage one and two. Um, and I think <laughs> I, I could definitely see me going through all the stages, but definitely nestled in, in stage one for sure. So how do you use your awareness of your own racial identity development um, and the, just the theory in general to support cross-racial conversations? One, recognizing and understanding balance and that people are at different places on their journey. Um, this idea of wanting to teach, because I, I definitely wanted to answer the question. Um, so understanding that people are in different places in their racial identity journey and wanting to teach and then not wanting to say the wrong thing. So um, I sometimes find myself struggling or like deciding when to speak or when to hold back. Um, and all of these things I, I struggled with or I've experienced at one point or another in my, in my lifetime. <laughs> whether it was in, in grade school, college, my, my professional career. So it's, it's kind of like having that grace or um, using that wait time. I, I always like to say Abby's wait time because uh, she has a, a great amount of wait time. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of going back and it's like, okay, I remember being in that space. So I'm going to have a little bit of grace um, for for that particular participant. And so I can't really get frustrated if someone does not immediately get something that I'm trying to relay. Um, so putting putting myself in their shoes because I I don't immediately get get a certain concept or I don't immediately understand something because I was once there. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Annalise, now I'm gonna ask you uh, to share your story. Sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so during my second year of teaching um, at a high school here in Grand Rapids, a new English teacher joined my department. While we had a lot in common, including both being white women, our lived experiences and our teaching approaches differed. Um, she had a few more teaching years of teaching experience than I had. And while I had attended all white schools and was raised in a primarily white suburban community, she had grown up in Detroit and had taught at a school there with a primarily black student body. And while I was really struggling as a new teacher, she seemed to always have original ideas and effective approaches. In only two months at the school, she had already made deep relationships with some former students that I hadn't been able to reach. Her classroom always felt collaborative, open, enjoyable, while mine to me often felt very hectic and draining. Um, the more I worked with her, the more it became apparent that there was something she had, something she understood, um, some self-work she had done, and something that seemed to come so natural to her that was a struggle for me. I had a really strong impulse um, to push away the discomfort that arose in myself from seeing my potential deficiencies and to tell myself that I was doing an excellent job and I didn't have to examine my practice. After all, I told myself, I really did believe all of my students could succeed, no matter their skin color. And I was a kind and approachable teacher and race wasn't an issue for me, I thought. Looking back, I now understand that what this teacher truly embodied was called culturally responsive practice. Um, she really was a master teacher. And a big part of that was her cultural competence. Her facility was talking about race and her ability to build authentic relationships. Um, against this foil, <laughs> I saw myself in a new and honest light. Um, here I was, a well-meaning white teacher of students of, col of color who didn't get it. I felt like an imposter. I realized I was blind to the dynamics of culture and race in my classroom, in education, and in the world. 
A little later that school year, I remember sitting at the dining room table in my upstairs apartment um, over on Franklin Street. And it was a really sunny day, but my spirits were low. My ancient heavy silver Dell laptop was open. Google.com was on the screen and I was staring at the search bar, searching for the words to search for in order to fill in what I now knew that I didn't know. At that moment, my husband came home and I needed to talk to him right then and there. It felt almost like a confession and owning up to a reality that I had ignored. I said, Alex, I don't know anything about race. I don't know how to talk about it. I don't know how to talk to my students about it. And I don't even think I know how to teach my students. Um, he may have comforted me and given me a hug in that moment, but mostly I remember his words. So what can you do about that? The question really stung. Um, I wanted him to help me absolve my guilt. I wanted empathy for my ignorance, but instead he convicted me of my agency. Thank you for sharing your story, Annalise. Uh, same questions as I asked Lauren, uh, where do you see yourself in this story that you just told, told to us in relation to your own racial identity development? Yeah, um, I definitely think when you look at this, these stages I was <laughs> being launched from my color blindness <laughs> um, through this juxtaposition of myself with this other teacher, I, I came to see there was something I was blind to. And then I moved into the guilt and shame phase where um, I really felt deep feelings of shame that <laughs> I, was some, I wasn't what I thought I was and guilt that I had probably hurt my students or done a disservice to them in ways that I didn't know. So those feelings were really strong for me. Um, and then I think the question, what are you gonna do with it, about it? Pushed me, um, pushed me somewhere very beginning <laughs> to the next stages of, I, I moved from I don't know what I don't know to I know that I don't know. And I had to figure that out. Um, but I still had no understanding of systems of oppression, um, my own whiteness, <laughs> or what it meant to be white in this world. So definitely at those beginning, those beginning stages. How do you use your awareness of your own racial identity development and, and the theory in general to support cross-racial conversations? Yeah, I think similar to Lauren, um, just, just understanding this process um, gives me empathy <laughs> um, because it's, it's such a human process and it's something that we all go through or need to go through. Um, so I have empathy for people when I lead this work because it is emotional work, the discomfort and strong emotions are, they're part of the developmental process. <laughs> Guilt and shame are right there. Um, but I think when I think about this story and my own development, it doesn't stop there. That's not the goal, <laughs> guilt and shame. Um, and my husband's comment pushed me to agency. So that push that comes along with the empathy when we're facilitating these conversations. Um, I think we also can't assume based on someone's race where they're at <laughs> in their own racial identity development um, I think that's important to keep in mind as facilitators. Um, and then it's interesting to think too, as a facilitator, when you have a group of people on very different um, places in their own racial identity development, how they might interact with um, or perceive others within and across racial groups. So just keeping that in mind. And then finally, understanding this is a process and Lauren alluded to this too, it's not ever done, it's lifelong. Um, and so the goal is not perfection, it's not blame or shame, it's for all of us to see and embrace our own humanity and our own agency. Um, and I, I very strongly um, identify this with the last stage for white People. It's a positive connection <laughs> to being white. Um, and then the active pursuit, that commitment. 
Well, thank you so much, Annalise. Uh, and again, thank you, Lauren, for sharing your stories and, and just talking about your own craft and facilitation um, and how, how those connections are helpful to you. So as we transition now to strategies, uh, additional strategies to employ really during the facilitation of conversations about race, uh, I wanna summarize this work that we've been talking about, which is kind of the foundation of the preparation to facilitate. So in thinking about <clears throat> uh, getting ready to actually engage in facilitation, um, you think about being able to understand that you can understand and, and return to the reasons why it's important and necessary to talk about race and racism that you understand and can, can anticipate the reasons why people are reluctant to engage in conversations about race and racism. That you understand and you can tell stories about the development of your own racial consciousness and that you're ready to engage your own courage and set aside expectations of perfection. And we're gonna talk about this again in, in a bit more detail here in just a moment. So now that you're grounded in an understanding of the imperative of talking about race and developing your own racial consciousness and identity, uh, let's talk about helpful approaches to facilitating cross-racial conversations. So our use of the phrase helpful approaches here is deliberate. Um, as with most everything in working with a group of diverse individuals, there is not a single recipe for success. But learning and practicing these strategies equips you as a facilitator with a solid range of approaches to employ when you need them. Now, we often facilitate in pairs or small teams, uh, and we recommend doing so whenever you can. Uh, but that's obviously not always possible or preferable. Uh, and that being said, each of these approaches is applicable whether you are facilitating alone or as part of a team. With the note that when you're facilitating as part of a pair or a team, you want to ensure open and clear communication among your group before and throughout uh, the facilitated conversation about what approaches you may want to utilize. Also deliberate in, is our use throughout this webinar of the terms facilitator and facilitation. And I want to take a moment uh, to differentiate between facilitating and presenting. So what we're doing in this webinar is obviously presenting. Uh, we're sharing information and you are taking it in. Uh, the stakes are pretty low for both me and for you. Like I know what I wanna say, what information I wanna share ahead of time. I'm expected to have the information and you expect to learn from it. And I have a lot of control over the content and how I share it and how it's discussed. And you primarily get to just listen. Facilitation, however, is much different. As a facilitator, you set and hold the space for dialogue and spend most of your time listening to participants and guiding and supporting conversation. You're still responsible for sharing content, but that content is designed to support and set the stage for dialogue and to scaffold and support equitable participation in the dialogue. You're much more focused and spend much more time on guiding the process rather than sharing content. So while the strategies we're gonna discuss now may have some applications for presenters or presenting, we do intend and we'll be discussing these in terms of facilitation. So we're gonna talk through uh, 10 helpful approaches for facilitating conversations about race and racism um, from forewarning and planning uh, that this conversation is going to happen to being sure to keep the focus on race throughout, uh, to validating, encouraging, and expressing admiration uh, for the courage of your participants. So let's dig into each one uh, a little bit deeper. First, forewarn, plan, and purposefully instigate race talk. Obviously, conversations about race pop up without planning. And many of the strategies we'll discuss can be used when conversations emerge organically. But as a school leader, it's important that you commit to leading conversations about race, especially with your staff. When you are planning to purposefully instigate or open conversations about race, let people know that that's what you're gonna be talking about. Let them know what to expect by sharing objectives and agendas ahead of time. You may also wanna have them read a common grounding text, which could be an article, a reading, a book, a video, a podcast, anything that participants can access on their own ahead of time. In fact, this grounding text can even be the main content of the session and that the conversation will be about discussing the grounding text. 
A grounding text can also provide an on-ramp though to the dialogue by sharing common definitions or specific concepts that you'll use in the dialogue without being the main focus of the conversation. Second, set and use norms or agreements. So I acknowledge that people feel all kinds of ways about setting and using norms. Uh, and people usually have a negative impression though of norms when norms are set and then not utilized. So norms are an incredibly helpful tool to support both you as a facilitator and your participants throughout a conversation. You can create and introduce the norms as the facilitator or co-create them as a group, uh, but in either case, you should take the time to ensure that everyone understands what they mean and that everyone is willing to adhere to them. They're especially helpful when the conversation gets tense. Going back and reminding participants about the norms or even holding an individual accountable to them can help you move people through those tense spots in the conversation. We have some of our favorite norms uh, that we've found to be particularly helpful over time uh, and just want to share those with you today as well and feel free to copy and use them uh, to the degree that they work for you in your context. But we ask that our participants stay engaged, that they remain morally, emotionally, intellectually and socially involved in the dialogue. We ask that they speak their truth, that they take risks and that they're honest about their thoughts, feelings and opinions that they bring their whole self to the space and have faith that others are going to do that too. We ask that if they wonder, they ask. We ask them to pursue learning and to push and probe each other's thinking. We ask our participants to experience discomfort. We ask them to lean in and expect that discomfort is part of the process and to embrace the learning that happens. Ask that they hold each other in compassionate accountability that we expect that we're all gonna make mistakes that, and that we'll all help one another address and learn from those mistakes in a way that demonstrates compassion for ourselves and each other. We ask that our participants expect and accept non-closure, that they commit to ongoing dialogue and the learning process, knowing that there are no quick fixes to entrenched and systemic challenges. And then uh, one very uh, technical one, we ask that they use technology to enhance learning. Uh, to commit to minimizing distractions and using technology to deepen their learning. Third, establish and use a shared set of definitions. So having the language to talk about race and racism is important, and I think sometimes it's taken for granted. But some people's definitions may differ, and some terms may be unknown to people. Thus, it's helpful to name and define key terms so that everyone has the tools they need to engage in the conversation and to bring down some of the anxiety that specific terms like racism and racist may create. It's also helpful to keep those definitions visible, either at the front of the room, on a handout, in a shared document, and return to them when you need to manage the process, again, just like the norms, such as when a term is misused, misunderstood, or triggers a strong emotion. Fourth, understand, acknowledge, and validate emotions. And a reminder here that emotions are not bad or a barrier to facilitating conversations about race. They are important and essential to facilitating conversations about race. As Elena Aguilar has said, systems of oppression want us to disconnect from our emotions. And conversations about race and racism are part of dismantling systems of oppression. Thus, they provide an opportunity for us to connect to our emotions. So it's important to continuously develop an awareness of your own emotions, your own emotions when facilitating. And there will be times when the conversation and individual participants hurt, challenge, or trigger you. That's natural. But being aware of those strong emotions helps you manage them to both care for yourself in the moment and serve the learning of the group. You might say something like, when X said Y, I felt Z because, or when X said Y, I felt Z, and I'm wondering if it made anyone else feel a certain way. It's also important to continuously develop your ability to be aware of the emotions that surface among your participants. Again, it's okay to say, I noticed that this has brought up some strong emotions, or how are you feeling right now? Don't avoid the emotions, your own or those of others. It's helpful and necessary to the conversation to name, normalize, and validate them. 
Fifth, keep the focus on race. Because of all the reasons that we named earlier, people can be reticent to engage in conversations about race and racism. A common strategy to avoid it is to try to redirect the conversation to something that is more comfortable. I'm sure you've heard someone say, but what about income or what about gender? Your goal when facilitating conversations about race is to keep the focus on race. You can and should name that race is one part of a person's multifaceted and intersectional identity. It intersects with, us, with ethnicity, language, gender, socioeconomic status, birthplace, and any other number of factors. But remember that we started this webinar by highlighting the degree to which racism is endemic to nearly every aspect of our society. It must be discussed. And as a facilitator, you understand and can return to the reasons why it's important and necessary to talk about race and racism. Keeping this focus on race actually can also help participants recognize how race intersects with and impacts the other aspects of identity. Sixth, stay personal, local, and immediate. While your participants may be entering the conversation at different stages in their own racial identity development and with varying levels of racial consciousness, as a facilitator, you are working from the premise that everyone is impacted by race and racism all the time. Thus, you want to continuously push participants to look inward and speak from their own thoughts and experiences. It's not uncommon for people to move to second and third person statements. Things like, you know that, or you know how, or they think, but as a facilitator, you want to invite participants to rephrase their statement from their own perspective or experience, sharing what they have lived or witnessed or what they think or how they've thought in the past. Seventh, control the process, not the content. And this strategy brings us back to a reminder about how facilitation is different from presentation. Remember that the role of facilitation is much more about listening than talking. And much of your talking is about guiding the process that supports the conversation, using the norms to hold the space for dialogue, making process observations to work through difficult spots, helping participants differentiate between intention and impact when their own contributions to the dialogue cause harm or elicit strong emotions. And it's absolutely helpful at times for you to share your own stories and perspectives, but as a support or a scaffold to invite others into the conversation. It's also important for you to intervene when there are glaring fallacies in statements that are made and spend time unpacking the mental models and emotions that underlie them. Your role as a facilitator is not to teach, but to leverage the experiences and knowledge of everyone in the room to create the learning. In order to make that happen, you are most focused on creating and holding a space in which participants are willing to take risks and everyone experiences the rewards. Eighth, sometimes you have to take a break to keep moving forward. Sometimes you're going to get stuck. You're going to encounter a situation that you feel unprepared to manage. The room gets quiet or gets tense and you're not sure what to do. Someone says something that seems so out of bounds that you freeze. So here are two quick strategies that you can use in the moment. Try asking everyone to just pause and reflect silently on what has just happened. This also gives you time, obviously, as a facilitator to pause and reflect and regroup too. So then invite participants to share their reflections and work from those reflections as kind of a reset from the precipitating event. Remember, you don't have to be the expert in the room. Part of your role is to pull on the contributions that everyone brings to this space. Or when conversations become heated or they get focused solely within two or three or a small number of participants, try pausing the dialogue and inviting someone else to share their input or thoughts about what's been unfolding. Again, you don't have to have all the responses or all the answers. You need to manage the process and invite everyone into the learning. Sometimes though, an in the moment intervention may not work through the challenge that you're experiencing. Sometimes you may need to pause the conversation all together and then return to it later. It happens. Remember, you're not striving for perfection. Doing so actually works against authentic facilitation and learning. But when you need to cut a conversation short, be clear soon after, if not in that moment, about when and where the conversation will be reconvened. <clears throat> 
and then use the time in between to regroup and rethink about what you need to do to manage the process differently next time. And notice I said differently and not better because facilitation is all about learning. It's not about achieving. Ninth, use a racial affinity grouping. So remember that while everyone is impacted by racism, Black, Indigenous, and people of color and white people are affected very differently by racism. Thus, the work that each group has to do is different. Because this work is different, it can be helpful to convene specific conversations or parts of conversations about race and racism in racial affinity groups rather than a, in a larger cross-racial group. Racial affinity groups provide Black, Indigenous, and people of color the space for healing, processing experiences of internalized racism, and working toward liberation within a group of individuals whose backgrounds, lived experiences, and identities are impacted by racial trauma and oppression. Affinity groups provide white people the space to dive deeper into understanding white supremacy culture and white privilege and how they have upheld and benefited from them and then implicate themselves in dismantling them without placing the burden of this learning on their black indigenous and people of color colleagues and friends. And finally, encourage and express admiration and appreciation to those who do speak up. We argue that because of our history of racial injustice, oppression, and trauma, there is no such thing as a safe space for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. But there can be a brave space for everyone. Because of everything that we've talked about in this webinar, engaging in conversations about race and racism takes personal courage. And that personal courage should be recognized. Take the time in the moment and at the end of conversations to name and validate the courage of participants' contributions. Follow up with participants outside of the facilitated conversation, thanking them for contributing to the group learning or encouraging those who are quiet to contribute next time. Now, as educators, we all know about the power of positive reinforcement, but this is also about recognizing and encouraging courage in order to help it spread. A few final thoughts on facilitating conversations about race and racism before we move into our questions and answers. So we've said it before, uh, but it's worth repeating over and over again. Just keep practicing. Every time you facilitate, you learn more. You learn more about the topic, about the participants, and you learn more about yourself as a facilitator. Second, debrief your facilitation experiences. So we try to build in time after every facilitation to debrief as a team. It's helpful for us to unpack our experience as a facilitator, including what we think worked well, what we would do differently, what emotions came up for us, and how we manage them in the moment. While you may not be part of a facilitation team, uh, think about asking someone to observe you facilitate uh, so that you can have someone to debrief with and get feedback to continue your learning and development and facilitation. Another thing worth repeating is don't expect perfection. Be compassionate with yourself as a facilitator. Embrace each session you facilitate as an opportunity to learn. You'll make what feel like mistakes. You'll feel like you didn't do a great job. You may get negative feedback, but be kind to yourself and recommit to learning and growing. And finally, find facilitated dialogues about race and racism to participate in. As a facilitator, you don't get much opportunity to engage in the conversation. So find conversations facilitated by others to participate in. You'll learn by observing how other facilitators operate while having the luxury of using that space to further your own personal learning as a culturally responsive anti-racist leader. So I think it's time for us to move into questions and answers. Yes, if you, um, if you don't want to type your questions and you prefer to say them out loud, if you uh, click the raise hand button, um, I can promote you and um, move you to a panelist and you can unmute yourself and you can talk. So <laughs> that's the fun thing about webinars is that um, as an attendee, you can't speak, but if you'd like to speak, I can definitely move you um, if you prefer not to type. So you just have to raise your hand and I could see you. Um, but this is the opportunity um, to speak. So we'll give you a couple minutes. Um, I see some comments. Thanks, Lemetria. 
This was a joy putting together. So thank you all for attending. We are recording this session. Um, so, and it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat box or in the Q and A box at this time. Um, so we can go to no hands raised either. All right, well, we will give you a mechanism uh, to follow up with any questions that you may have uh, afterwards. Uh, but first, just wanna give a nod uh, to some resources that have been valuable to us um, that if you're interested in learning more about facilitation or picking up uh, some more facilitation tools or just digging deeper into some of the concepts and strategies that we talked about today, uh, we highly recommend um, the, the books Courageous Conversations About Race uh, by Glenn Singleton, uh, Daryl Wing Su's Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence, Understanding and Facilitating Difficult Dialogues on Race, uh, So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluo, and then if you're interested in learning more about facilitating conversations about race with students uh, rather than colleagues or groups of adults, uh, Matthew R.K.'s Not Light But Fire uh, is a good resource. I do also, see What's that? I see a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we have a question, how to best start talking about race without being perceived racist, especially when you are white? Do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. How to best start talking about race without being perceived racist, especially when you are white. Yeah. Um, well, so it, it sounds like um, I, I would be interested in kind of unpacking what's behind that question. I'm wondering if the assumption there is that talking about race is somehow racist or can be perceived as racist. Um, and I, I think that's where we reground ourselves in sort of the first part of this webinar, which is the, Im the imperative and the unavoidability of talking about race, right? You see how prevalent race and racism is in everything around us. Um, and so, you know, I, I think coming back to the resources here, there are any number of entry points uh, to talking about or introducing conversations about race and racism. Um, and specifically, um, these three websites, uh, Racial Equity Tools, Rethinking Schools, and Teaching Tolerance, uh, offer a number of very solid uh, and easily accessible grounding texts uh, from, you know, concepts uh, from why colorblindness uh, is, is not actually a valid approach uh, to, to race, um, to issues of um, implicit bias, uh, to white supremacy culture. Um, so I think in thinking about where you wanna start, there are lots of these resources. Um, and again, going back to where are you going to feel comfortable opening that conversation? And what's the work that you're gonna do leading into it to really ground yourself um, in your why and in your own racial identity and your own experiences. They, um, any grounding texts that are appropriate for elementary and secondary children that you can share? Uh, we would be actually, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, let me go here. Um, and since we don't know who necessarily who's asking the question, um, please contact us. <laughs> <laughs> wanted me to share her name, but I do have your contact information and um, I can follow up. I didn't know if she wanted me to like say her name out loud, <laughs> yeah. but I will share. Um, a, a set of grounding texts uh, for elementary students and for teachers of elementary students. So um, please reach out or Lauren will reach out to you. Yes, I will share that with you. Um, and she said that would be great. So I will be, be sure to reach out to you and share those resources. Well, it looks like uh, we are right at time, our allotted time uh, for the webinar. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us uh, in our first, the first webinar in our Courageous Leadership Learning Series. Um, again, as Lauren noted, this has been recorded and we will make it uh, widely accessible uh, to all those who were invited. And please feel free to share with others whom you think might be interested. And finally, if you'd like to follow up for additional resources or with additional questions, uh, please don't hesitate 
uh, to email Lauren, Annalise, or myself. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.